he keeps his vows. He sure does. We've been singing about the faithfulness of God all morning. And I love this because I have a feeling that uh, this might even come up today uh, as we're teaching. So if God is always pursuing us with his love, if his vows are always true, if he's always faithful no matter what, how should we respond to that? How do we respond to a God who always does what he says he is going to do? What other way than praise? What other way than worship? What other way than to fall on our knees and say, Lord, you are the almighty God. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. You are our supporter. You are our strength. Because he is all of those things, he will always be all of those things. So, worship team, Mary Ellen, I love that you just allow the Lord to speak through you. Melissa, we just take us back to this place where we're responding to this. We're responding to this reckless love of God. We're responding to the fact that God is always chasing us. He is always pursuing us. No matter what we're doing, right or wrong, He is always there for us. Let's continue to worship Him and praise Him. How do we respond? How do we respond to this? How do we respond to this? The God that created the universe. Yeah, hallelujah. The God that created the universe is here. And I don't know if you know, if you felt the presence of God in here, but there have been miracles happening this morning. There's been prayer happening this morning here. There's been worship happening this morning. There's been praise happening this morning. So what do we do about that? How do we respond to it? Our uh, service team is going to prepare to receive our tithes and offerings today. And it is really fitting that this is the place where we are in worship today. So fitting. I love the fact that we don't really compare notes before we get up on this platform because God's got it all worked out, you know? Like, <laughs> what are you going to sing about? What are you going to talk about? Well, I don't know. God knows. You know, last week you heard both Pastor Barry and me talk a little bit about King Jehoshaphat of Judah. And I'm going to go back there because there's something that, uh, there's something about God's character that I want to extract from this that we see throughout all of Scripture. It is part of who God is. And we just spent the morning, we have spent the morning so far in worship declaring that God is faithful, right? Declaring that God's promises are yea and amen. Declaring that the things of God that have always been will always be. So when we talk about an element of God's character, we're talking about something that has never changed and never will change. Now, with us, there are elements of our character that change. It is supposed to. According to Scripture, our, we are supposed to grow in character, right? But who God is doesn't have to change or grow. And so here we have a situation, again, uh, just to kind of rehash what's happening in Judah. This is in, be teaching here from Second Chronicles chapter 20. And what's happening is three large armies are coming at Judah to destroy Judah. All three of these armies are larger than Judah's army combined. It is a massive force coming against Judah. So they hear about this. The people of Judah hear about this. And their response, I keep asking this question, what should our response be? Their response it says, the people of Judah, in verse 4, came together to seek help from the Lord. And then the Lord responded to them by saying, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for this battle is not yours, but it's God's. And last week we talked about how God fights our battles for us before we even get to the battlefield, which is what we see happen here. So the, the end of this particular story goes that 
King Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah were faithful to the word of God, they praised and worshiped him as a result of him saying that this battle is not yours, it's God's. So by the time they got to the battlefield, the Lord had caused the other three armies to fight amongst themselves. So when the, the Judeans got to the battlefield, that vast army was already dead. They were already gone. And here's, I mentioned this last week, but here's really what I want to point out. Jehoshaphat and his men, I'm reading from now verse 25, 2 Chronicles 20. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value. Listen, more than they could take away. This is the character of God. This is who God is. And we see this over and over from Genesis to the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, that when God gives, he doesn't give just enough. He shows up just on time and gives more than we can receive. And in this case, there was so much plunder that it took thousands of Judeans three days to collect it all. So they got there and they couldn't even, there was too much. We see this happen. We see God do this a lot, right? In 2 Kings chapter 4, there was a a widow. Her husband had recently recently died in battle. And she and her son were poor. And the creditors were coming to collect on her husband's debt. And they had nothing. So Elijah the prophet of God said this to the widow, go around and ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Don't ask for just a few, he said. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons, pour all of the oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Verse five, she left him and shut the door behind hers and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, go bring me another one. And he replied, there's not a jar left. And at that moment, the oil stopped flowing. So she went to the man of God, to the prophet Elijah and said, and he said to her, go sell the oil and pay, listen to this, and pay all of your debts. He didn't say, hey, God's going to provide a skip a payment this month for you. It wasn't, uh, hey, if you want to refinance this, God will co-sign. No, it says, pay all of your debts. And this is what's amazing. And you and your sons can live on the rest. So not only did God satisfy the thing that she was afraid of, these creditors coming at her, but he went on to bless them for all of their lives. God is God, whether we're reading from an act that he did in the Old Testament or we're reading something that Jesus said in the New Testament, because every act of God in the Bible and in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of what was to come with Christ, right? Jesus did and said the same thing. In Luke 6, 38, he says, Jesus says this, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. Again, the thing that you have to contain my blessing can't. When you give, give and it will be given to you. In a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For by the measure that you use, it will be used to measure you. So God responds to our faithfulness with his giving. So how do we respond to God's faithfulness? How could we not respond with our giving? Whether it's giving our finances in offering It's giving our time, our talents, our treasures. 
I think there's just two ways to respond, really. And I know that we want to make it complicated sometimes, but I think that we can respond in faith by doing the things that God has asked us to do, or we can respond in fear. Now, I want to be careful here because I know that you might want to tune me out when I say faith versus fear, because we all experience fear. There's not sin in emotion. God gave, fear is a very useful emotion. I believe God gave us fear. When we experience fear, we know something's wrong. I need to pay attention. Something's wrong. The question is, what do we do with this? So many of us, I have absolutely been in this position. So many of us have worried about what's going to happen when this paycheck is gone. What's going to happen when this bill comes due? That's totally, absolutely normal and natural. Don't let anybody's words shame you in that moment. No, 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 no. That's not how we respond. We don't respond with shame and guilt. We respond in faith. You know, when, uh, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was in agony knowing what was coming the next day, in agony. He knew, he knew what was going to happen. He knew about the torture. He knew that, that people would be making fun of him and spitting him and spitting on him. And they, he knew that he was going to be nailed to a cross. And he was in such agony that he was sweating blood. Now, what do you call that? Joy? <laughs> Excitement? Happiness? <laughs> but how did he respond? He responded in faith. Lord, not by my will, Father, but by your will. I don't think that that fear needs to be the antithesis of faith. I think that fear can be a motivator of faith because it tells us there's something to pay attention to. If you go to give or you go to fulfill anything that God has asked in this scripture, any of his commandments, and you have something that, that you recoil from it because there's something that you're afraid of, there's something, it's that time to say, Lord, I feel this fear, I feel this, fill in the blank, whatever it is, Lord, help me to respond to this in faith. No matter what it is that we do, we're going to respond in faith. So what we're going to do right now is, if you haven't already prepared your tithe and offering, please go ahead and do that. We're going to pray over it, and we're going to respond in faith. And responding in faith simply means doing what you believe the Lord has called you to do based on his word. Father, we ask you right now for each and every single one of us, to touch us and communicate with us in a way that we know what your will is for us. And we know that your way is not the easiest way. In fact, Jesus even said that this world is going to have difficulties. Tomorrow is going to be difficult, he said. But Lord, help us to respond to that difficulty in faith. Help us respond to our successes in faith and our failures in faith. Help us to respond to our excitement and our joy in faith and our, our fear and our anger in faith like the people of Judah did when they were afraid this massive army was coming at them and they responded in faith and not only did you fight their battles for them but you provided such a plunder that they couldn't even take it all they couldn't even carry it all father help us to respond in faith Hold your offering today. Hold your, your tithe, your offering, whatever God has instructed you to do. And just thank him. Thank him for his faithfulness. Father God, we ask that you bless these gifts. We ask that you bless the givers. We thank you that you give givers gifts to give. We thank you that you have shown yourself mighty in this place today. And we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Boy, if you can't feel Jesus in here today, you're dead. In every sense of the word. Praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your presence. We worship you for who you are. You are the Lord God Almighty. You are Jehovah. Everything. There is nothing that we lack because you are everything. Lord, I thank you for your goodness that's in here that leads people to repentance, that brings us back to you. And whatever we're missing, you complete it. You make it whole. You touch us. Lord, thank you for completing the works in people that only you can do. We are so grateful that you are our God, that it is nothing else and nothing else in this world. We bless your name. I thank you for moving among your people today. I thank you that this is a house of miracles. That miracles happen today. In our mind, in our heart, in our bodies, in our soul and spirit. Everywhere. This is your place of miracles. This is your house of prayer. Lord, we want you more than anything else. We don't care about our own plans, Lord. We care about what you want to do. Have your way in us today. Help us all to leave changed, different today because we were with you. Thank you, Lord. Everybody said... Amen. Let it be done in your house today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for people in this house, the sheep that can hear the voice of God. I call our worship team, every single person, I call them blessed in Jesus' name. I call them anointed in Jesus' name. I call them set apart in Jesus' name. Thank you for leading us into the presence today. I got just a small ring, Chris. Not too bad. I love how God puts a service together. I really do. I like how we all hear God and then we all respond based on who we are with God. And just today, it set up everything just so nice. So perfectly, even with what Mary Ellen said, what Melissa did, Tony, I love how God just orchestrates something so cool. I wanted to teach something today I think is really one of the most, in my personal opinion, one of the most powerful things as Christians that we can do to change the world that we're in, to change our lives, and to change the lives of the people that we run into and meet. It's not talked about very much. There's not a lot of straight scripture that says, here's the ABC. But it's presented in stories. It's presented in, I read all of Paul's farewell greetings in all of the New Testament to, to get ready for this. And Paul always throws nuggets in at the very end. And it goes along with what I really want to teach because it's been coming up a lot. And I've been teaching people independently a lot of this. And I thought, well, what a great way to, to do it is to, to share it through Scripture. And I know if I start with this one thing, I've only taught from this one section of Scripture one time in my entire life. It was one of the very first times I ever did a message. 
and I've been drawn back to it again. But the thing of it is, there is a matrix of options of places you can go with the story. And I think I could honestly do something different for six months of Sundays. But I am going to focus on what I, I really believe the Lord wants me to focus on. But, and you're going to get other things from the story, and that's great. Because I believe the Lord will do whatever he has to do with each of you on it. And it is in Luke 15. It is the, it's the parable of the prodigal son. <clears throat> and if you bring things to take notes, you should. Or you can listen to this again sometime in the future and take notes. And tear into the story. Most of you have probably heard it. But Jesus was teaching a bunch of parables here. This is one in the middle about things that are lost and then get found. You were lost and now you're found. Yes. Right. And here he said there was a man that had two sons. The younger said, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. <clears throat> and not long after that, the younger son got together. Everything set off for a distant country, squandered his wealth and wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. <clears throat> when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will go back to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him, which goes along with exactly what Mary Ellen was saying. This is the nature of God. He sees you from afar off. He runs to you. He didn't wait for you to get to him. He comes to you because of the compassion that he has for you and he throws his arms around you and kisses you. And he said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and now he's found. So they begin to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing and the glitter ball. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother's come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered, look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who squandered everything with prostitutes comes home and kills, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he goes, my son, my father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we need to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and alive again. He was lost and is found. And you probably have a million things you're thinking of like I am. And I want to point out a few things in the story. So there's, there's two sons. One comes and says, I want what you're going to give me so I can have it now. So there's some things going on. We do this with the Lord. So this is a picture. These two people, both of these sons were both not right. And we're these people. We were lost people, but sometimes we get lost even after we've been found. And this one son, even after growing up and seeing everything, I still have an echo up here, if you can find it. If not, I can switch. Um, he comes up and says this. And you know, what I'm intrigued about this time is, what did, the, did the father argue with him about it? Did he say anything? What do you think you're doing? Haven't I taught you anything? Not one word. He goes, I want what's mine. And he lets him have it. Doesn't say a word to him. And this is just like how we are with God. 
think about it. We are the ones that don't understand how heaven works, how the laws of God work. Sowing and reaping. We don't know all of it. We don't understand it. How powerful forgiveness is. And this son doesn't want accountability. I don't feel like I have to answer even to you, Lord, about what I'm doing. How many times have we said that? I believe it's really because we don't really know who God is. Or it can be that we don't trust God. I know what your word says, but it is hard for me to trust you, Lord. Even the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Help me to understand. Help, with, help me with my unbelief. Or it could be simply this. <clears throat> I know you, the way you've told me to do it, Lord, but I'm going to do it my way. I think my way is better. We've all been there. But this is what's going on here when the son is saying, give me what's mine. He does not understand God, the character, the nature. He's been taught everything. He's refusing to do it now. I'm going to do it my way because it's better. And then he allows sin to take him on this path, this journey of spending and squandering, a wanting state, a need state, a lack state, dissatisfied state, and ultimately comes into complete madness to the point where he's willing just to eat the pig slop. If somebody would just give me the pig slop to eat, he couldn't even get that. And then you have the other son <clears throat> after he comes back. Look at the position that he thought he was in. After being in the presence of God and being taught, his response is, look, all these years I've been slaving, obeying you, and you've given me nothing extra. How many times have we said that to God? You're always blessing someone else, but you're not blessing me. You always seem to do it for someone else, but you're not doing it for me. And his response is, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. Do we really understand that everything that God has is ours? Peace is ours. Provision is ours. Wholeness is ours. Joy is ours. There is no lack in our life. If we have it, believe me, it's not because of God. Which one of these people are you? I hope the Lord challenges you. I hope the Spirit of the living God points things out to each and every one of you about this position of who we are and how we're acting. Because if something's spiritually wrong, it's us. Paul even said it, and I'll try to get into it. The point I want to focus on is not even really the two sons, because this is all of us and all the people that we're ever going to deal with. Most of these problems are all I mentioned right here. They might have heard about God, but they don't trust him. They might have heard about laws of God, but they're too afraid or too scared to try it. They want to blame somebody else. They want to think, well, my way's better. I don't care what you say. There's people that you try to help and give advice to, and they don't take it. And they keep making new decisions that make it their life even more difficult, no matter what you do. And we go around beating ourselves up trying to help people. And notice this is family. This is father and sons. And the one son who stayed saw himself as a slave. He didn't even see himself as a son. We are sons and daughters. We're not slaves. Right. 
And that is very important to see yourself as a son because when Paul did a lot of his writings, he said, if you're a son, then you're an heir to the inheritance. What's the inheritance? It is Jesus Christ. And everything that makes up Jesus Christ and who he is, that's yours right now, not just later. It's now. There's that going on. But what I want to talk to you about is the Father and how we need to be like the Father and how to handle these people in our life. The Lord's teaching us how to handle our family and close friends. I call it releasing people. And I've seen more productive results in this out of anything I've ever done with people and including your own family. So if your family's jacked up, you better pay attention because this is what I'm going to have you do. You're going to put this into practice. You're not just going to listen to this today and then walk out of here and forget it. This is why you need to write it down. You need to come up with a game plan. How are you going to do this? The father released him. And when he came back, his nature was such that even after he ran to his son, do you notice what he said, Father? He said all this stuff, just make me a slave. He goes, I didn't hear what you just said. The father goes, quick, bring the best robe, put it on, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. He is now officially a son again. The father is not going to hear it. He's not going to hear you talk about yourself being a slave. I'm talking down about yourself or saying that you don't understand. Your heavenly father is not going to either. He doesn't want to hear that from you. He's going to say, you're my son, you're my daughter. You have access to everything. And everything is accessible through faith. And both of the sons really didn't have faith. So just because you have stayed around and been in church and all that, it, it doesn't mean that you're, you don't look at yourself right. I want to make sure whoever we are, we're looking at ourselves right. We have the relationship the, the Lord wants us to have with him. You aren't a slave. You're a son and a daughter. Now the father released the son. He goes, if that's what you want, I'm going to let you have it. Here you go. So when your kids and grandkids and when your siblings and when you're, if it's your parents, if it's cousins, whoever, you need to release these people just like the father did. It might even be somebody who hurt, who hurt you a long time ago. And this is what allows you to be a forgiver of other people and what they've done. They might not even be alive now. It doesn't matter. The point is, you're, you're operating in a spiritual principle here in releasing people, in releasing the situation. So no matter what it is you're facing, it's God's problem, not yours. No matter what we face, it's God's problem. That's the perspective that we need to have. We tend to make things our problem. I've got to come up with an answer. I've got to deal with this person. No, you don't. And I'll show you in Scripture why you don't and how Paul didn't. I have had a couple of great opportunities recently. One, I, I play uh, some slow-pitch softball still because I still think I can play. So I play with this team because they, they like to win. So do I. I'm competitive. But one of the guys on the team I got to talking to, his mom comes to watch him play. And he's got a brother, and I happen to, I know this mom already from somewhere else. And so when we saw each other at the end of the season last year, she comes up and tells me, like, I, I, want, I want you to pray with me about something. And I said, well, what? She goes, my, my youngest son, he's running off. He's going to live with this girl and run away from God and, and everything. And, and I said... And, I'm, and she kept saying about how she's trying to tell him that's not what God wants you to do. And she's just saying all these things she's doing to try to control the situation. And I said, <clears throat> after she was done talking for a while, I said, I'm going to teach you something right now that's going to help. 
And I said, there isn't a cookie cutter answer here, but what I'm going to do is show you how to release your son. Don't try to convince him to stay with you. He wants to leave. Just, just like this. Release him. Say, okay, son, you can go. I love you. You can go. What, do you need anything? Take it with you. It's okay. Go ahead, take it. She goes, what? And I said, yeah. And I said, and before we were done, after I explained this story just like I am to you, I said, uh, I grabbed her hand. I said, we're, I, we're in the parking lot, and everybody's walking by and everything. I'm like, we're going to do it right here. I said, give me your hand. So I prayed with her, and I said, we release her son into the, into the hands of Jesus. And she's just crying. I said, and you're not going to do anything. You're not going to say anything. You're not going to call him and bother him all the time. <clears throat> all that's going to stop. You're just going to release him, and you're still going to just be his mom when he calls you. Just be the mom. That's who you are. You're his mother. Be his mother. Nothing else. Release him. And so we did that. And so this season has started up in the very first game <clears throat> that we were at. She made a point to be there. And she came up to me <clears throat> in the middle of a game. And uh, she goes, I couldn't wait any longer to, to wait till after the game was over. So while our team was hitting, she comes up in the dugout. Hey, I want to tell you something. I'm like, well, what? And she goes, my son came back. When I released him, the Lord dealt with him. And now he's back. He's repented. He is in my house and got away from all of the sin. And she goes, I just wanted to thank you for showing me that. And I'm like, well, this, it's biblical. It's the Lord. And I, I could tell a bunch of stories. A bunch. One of them, I, I remember I shared, this, I think it was a couple years ago on Scout Sunday, for those of you that were here, I'll say it again real quick. We had one of our boys, our, our scout troop that we run is about raising boys to be godly men. We use the scouting program, but it's all about a teaching tool to show them how they can hear the voice of God so that by the time they're 18, we lay hands on them and send them out. I believe they're ready for the world. But this one boy was so stubborn. He was really good friends with my youngest son. And he's a, he says he was a, a, a pronounced or un, personally announced atheist. He goes, I don't believe that there is a God at all, even though the rest of his family does go to church. And we were talking in this building about where the gettings are on that table when there was an island there. And I talked to him for an hour and a half there while we had something going on in here. And I said, you know what, Stephen, before you leave this building, I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do. Because we're done talking. I know you're not going to budge. That's fine. It was mostly him defending his perspective. I said, okay. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to release you into the hands of God. And so I prayed right there with him about, Lord, I know that you're real. I need you to show him that you're real. I'm releasing him into your hands. Lord, do whatever you have to do to show him that you are the Lord. And it wasn't nine months. First semester of college. Had this God moment that is now undeniable. Now he is serving God. I bought him a Bible. And he's learning on his own. God can take somebody who even wants to run away and go and bring them back. Why? Because there's going to be the point in verse 17 where it says, when they came to their senses. There is going to be that moment. And I don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be that they've lost all their money? Is it going to be that they have no food? Is it going to mean something else worse? I don't know. But when you release people, you have to be good with letting the Lord do what he's going to do with them. You have to be. You can't jump back in to these people's lives and try to be their Jesus. Did this prodigal father come looking for the son at any given time? Nope. He knew I'm going to release him. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to do everything spiritually I can. But there wasn't anything physical here anymore. Have you noticed that in here? Yep. We feel like we have to do something all the time. We're just these kinds of people. 
Lord, I, we have to, I got to do something. I can't allow this to happen. Yes, you can. You just need to release people into the presence of God. One of the things I've taught from in the past is Philippians 4. This is one of the other scriptures to supplement this process. In Paul's final exhortations here in Philippians 4, it, in 6 through 8, it says, Don't be anxious about anything, worrisome, fretful, fearful, but in every situation, by prayer and asking God with thanksgiving, present this request to God. So there should be a thankfulness in your heart when you're saying, Lord, I'm going to release this person. Thank you that you're going to do it, not me. Why do you do that? Because the next verse, 7, and the peace of God that passes all understanding. If you want to live your life in the place of peace, this is what you have to do. You have to release people. You have to release situations from your life. I live in peace. I refuse not to. People bring fear and all this stuff to me. I'm like, nope, you're releasing it all. I'm not taking it on. We're not, we're not designed to handle it. Have you noticed that? If you want to break yourself, that's a good way to do it. Keep taking on anxiety and panic and fear. Paul said in 2 Timothy at the very end, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. Paul didn't say, I'm getting even. Or I hope something happens to him. He goes, the Lord will repay. I've released him to God. I'm not involved anymore. And so he was telling Timothy, you should just be on your guard against this guy because he is opposed to our message and what God is doing. And he said, <clears throat> at my <clears throat> first defense, no one came to my support and everyone deserted me. May it not be held against him. So even the people that didn't help Paul, he didn't say, Lord, get even with them. He said, Lord, don't hold it against these people. That's really releasing people. That's forgiving people, releasing people. This is how we live. Then he says, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that my message could be proclaimed and all the Gentiles could hear it. So in other words, Paul focused on his calling, what the Lord had for him. And he says, I was delivered from the lion's mouth and the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. First Peter, end. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We're not designed to take on the anxiety, the fear, the panic. That's not how we live. The Lord never, at any given time, if you follow his, him in the Gospels, did you, was there ever a point where the Lord panicked? Or the Lord had to hurry up and rush and do anything? Or the Lord had to get involved in everybody's personal stuff? No. No, he didn't. He dealt with people when they came to him. And he's releasing people. And he's letting them. He would teach people, like the rich young ruler, he goes, here's what you're lacking. But he still went away every, anyway. There's plenty of people who couldn't follow he goes, Nicodemus taught him everything, showed him everything. I just can't quite do it. But this is what I want you to focus on today with this. I want you to apply this to your life, not just listen to this and leave here today. If you want to make a big difference in your family, your friends, your community, is you have to learn not to take this all on yourself, but you have to start learning to release people to God. Release the situation that you're in with them to God. Lord, this is you, not me. You have to handle it. You pray for these people. You forgive these people. You say, Lord, don't hold that sin against them. And if you're not there yet, that's fine. You know where we're going, right? I'm showing you the picture of what it needs to look like. And believe me, I'm preaching to myself too. Because we, we're all one of these two sons, these kids. And we all are at times doubt things and we don't trust God. And I know what your word says to forgive him, but I can't, Lord. We've all been there. But take it from the Lord and Paul because Christ worked in Paul so mightily with this and even to the point where he was saying the same things. I'm not getting even with these people even when they're trying to defy God himself. I'm releasing the people 
I'm going to let God do it. I'm walking in forgiveness and I'm keeping my joy even though I'm in prison. I'm keeping my peace even though I'm in prison, even though they just beat me right now and I'm bleeding. I'm keeping my peace because it's all, it's internal. It doesn't matter how chaotic our outside is. This peace and joy has to be in here. That's our strength. That's the only way you're going to make it. So this is a very, very practical thing that I wanted to share with you today because it's just, it's coming up a lot lately. And I want you to be one of the people who release situations and people to God. Trust me, God knows how to handle them. Let him do what he needs to do in their life. Don't, don't worry about it. It is not your job to worry about other people and their walk with God. Let him do it his way. Because that atheist in a few months is going to be saved. That family member that you're having a tough time with is going to come back. Another story. When we, I just remember this one. So when we were in a, a prayer meeting years ago, over 20 years ago now, similar thing. This couple didn't know where their daughter was, hadn't spoken to her in over 10 years. Lord, we have, I don't even know if she's alive, Lord. So there was about 15 of us or so in this prayer when we were praying at the end. He's like, you know, the Lord showed me something while we were praying. And I said, what? And he goes, I need to just release my daughter to the Lord. And he said, go home. He told me to go home and take one of our bedrooms and pull, put, pull all of her stuff out and put it in there. Make the bed, put her stuff up on the wall and put her things back in the closet as she's coming in. I said, well, if I were you, brother, I'd do that. I said, we prayed again, we released her to the Lord. And you know what? That daughter he hadn't spoken to in years, within just a couple weeks, he got a call. Wow. She was just on the streets in New York. Wow. And she said, Dad, I want to come home. He said, I'm sending you money for a ticket. Come home. And she came home. Bus ticket all the way back. Moved back, moved right into the room, and she just broke down when all, her room was already made up. Wow. We're people of faith. When you release people by faith, we have to let the Lord do it His way. The minute you stop worrying about stuff is the minute God can start doing something about it. If you want to take it on and keep it yourself, you're welcome to. And you can stay in the pig slop, but we recommend not doing that. Hopefully you come to your senses and realize that the Lord God Almighty is way bigger than us. And no matter how difficult he allows a situation to be in someone's life. We still pray for them. We still support them. If they need something from us, we give it. We, we do all that. But we let the Lord do it. And you will see the results from it. Because it isn't us. We have to stop thinking it's our works that are going to make a big difference. It's your faith that's going to make a big difference. Your faith makes the difference. Stop doing stuff. Paul spent all of Galatians dealing with it. It's faith in God, in Christ alone. By faith through grace are you saved. You did nothing to get it. God's coming after you. you we don't deserve that. We don't deserve it. But he's doing it anyway. This is why I don't believe we'll ever understand grace all the way while we're here. I think it's impossible, frankly. We just keep learning a little bit more about it. I think it's going to be like that all the way till Jesus comes back. But learn everything you can. But you have to, again, trust the process. I believe that's one of the, one of the many reasons why the Lord taught that parable. This is a picture of heaven and you. And this is what the Father did. He released you too so that you can run to his goodness. So make your list when you get home. Who are you releasing? What are you releasing? What situations are you releasing to God? And say, Lord, I'm done. I'm fully giving you this. I'm never going to bring it back into my hands ever again. 
you have your way with these people, with this situation, and I promise you he will show up and do what you thought would never happen. You will see things you never thought you would ever see on this side of eternity when you do this. There's a lot of stories. Impossible people running from God that are back serving. Impossible. That's because it's God and not us. All we have to do is what he shows us to do. So Lord, your presence has been here all day. Thank you, Lord, for showing us your character and nature. Thank you for giving us a godly example of how to live, how to release people just like you did in the story. How we give them to you that we won't fix people, that we won't clean them up. We will let the Holy Spirit lead people to you. We will let the Holy Spirit clean them up. We will let the Holy Spirit guide and lead them into all truth, that we won't do your job anymore. I thank you, Lord, for giving each person here the insight, the wisdom to know where to start with this. Thank you, Lord, for modeling it so clearly. I thank you, Lord, that we will see the results, the fruit of this quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to help you guys out with something because you're going to go back and you're going to open up your Bibles and you're going to read this parable of of the prodigal son. And you might be a little bit confused, so I just want to let you know that the words glitter ball, only appear in the King Carl translation of the Bible. But what, what, what an amazing, no, like just practical way to practice God's character by releasing someone. And what a, a great illustration of forgiveness that is that Pastor Carl just gave us. You know, the idea of releasing somebody, it's... Uh, it's not about them. It's about our response in faith to what God has said. Uh, I, and I love that when the, the older son who had been there the whole time said, hey, what about me? I've been here all along. I've slaved for you. I've always done everything you've asked me to do and blah, blah, blah. And you never made a fat cat for me. And the father says, what? Don't you understand that everything I own is yours? And so Carl also mentioned that, uh, uh, that, that Paul had said that we're, we're heirs of God. But he goes on to say that we're co-heirs with Christ. And there are some, so many things in Scripture, and this is one of them that just blow my, the idea that we are co-heirs with Christ. If you study that, it means that our, our inheritance in the kingdom is equal to that of Jesus' inheritance in the kingdom. Because... God is infinite. Heaven is infinite. So any portion of infinite that we get is infinite. Does this make sense? Like there's no, in the kingdom of God, it's not like you get 0.1%, you get uh, 2%, you get, it's not like that at all. The division doesn't work out that way. That's why Jesus said, there are many rooms in my father's house. If it weren't this way, I would have already told you. In other words, there's plenty of room for everybody. And everybody is entitled to the same inheritance which is everything. So uh, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up, and I'm going to release you because I know that many of you I won't see or hear from for another seven days. So I am going to believe in faith that uh, I'm going to release you over to the Lord this week and all of your uh, all of your regular daily routines, uh, work and family, and the things that you're going to be doing this week. I just believe that uh, the the Lord is going to be with you, is going to bless you, is going to guide you, and just going to ask for all of us on all of our benefit on all of our behalf for the Lord just to help us to understand that we are co-heirs with Christ. Help us to understand that everything that you have is ours, and our response should always be to go to you. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Have a great week.